Hello, renegade marketers. There is a point in every CMO's career when the brand you have isn't the brand you need to move the business forward. In some cases, the decision is made for you upon arrival, as in you're here to fix the brand. But in others, you're part of a team that comes to this realization, we've got to reimagine our brand. Now, regardless of how you get there, it is a moment of truth, one that tests a CMO's organizational, strategic, and executional skills, often at the same time in an incredibly short time frame. And as longtime listeners of this show know, perhaps all too well, it is a perfect opportunity to apply the CATS framework, as in courageous strategy, artful ideation, thoughtful execution, and scientific method. Now, speaking of cats or cool cats, I'm thrilled to introduce you to today's guest, Noreen Galsian, CMO of SADA. Hello, Noreen, welcome. Hello, Drew, thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, how are you and where are you? Uh, I'm doing really well, thank you for asking, and I'm based in Los Angeles, California. All right, hometown, home of the Los Angeles Dodgers and Lakers. Okay, so now I noticed on your LinkedIn profile, and I love this, that you have the hashtag, I am remarkable. Now, what inspired you to add that, and has that sparked some interesting conversations? It has sparked some interesting conversation. So I Am Remarkable is a Google initiative um, that uh, started many years ago via Google employees. We came together to really have a framework for allowing uh, everyone to have a voice, underrepresented groups, women and other underrepresented groups to be able to boast, if you will, about their accomplishments and brag about themselves more, really to bring their accomplishments forward and openly feel comfortable to discuss them and to share them. So I became an I Am Remarkable facilitator a few years ago, and it's, uh, it's a session that we run within SADA as well as some other partners, but it's global initiative. And especially for Pride Month this month, there's several sessions running. So if you've never joined, I highly recommend it. Very cool. <clears throat> for those of us who are not in a minority, I think we would have to, we need our own like humble brag or something like that. <laughs> but uh, well, makes how to be an ally, yes, right? Exactly. To allow underrepresented groups to have a voice. Yeah, no, to totally, uh, totally agree. Now, I noticed you started your career in the fashion industry and you spent eight years at the California Market Center. Now that's a long stay for a first job. And based on that start, are you kind of surprised you end up in B2B tech? I certainly never imagined I would. <laughs> that was not my career goal at the time. Uh, I loved fashion. I worked in retail for many years um, throughout high school and college. So I really wanted to stay within the fashion industry. And um, I, my first job out of college was to do marketing for fashion weeks in Los Angeles. So as you can imagine for a 20 something year old, this was like a very exciting job, a lot of interesting uh, fashion week parties and designer events and things like that. It was, it was wonderful experience. Um, but that's kind of where I started the, the B2B exposure, if you will, because I worked with the designers who were working with the retailers and to kind of bring the two together throughout the fashion weeks and various events that we did and campaigns. So that was my first exposure from a B2B side, but certainly not tech. <laughs> there was nothing technical at the time. No, I don't want to great... myself, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> well, but I mean, I, I, what a great place to start. And, but I imagine after, a because you were there a long time and you certainly got a good look at the fashion industry. And at some point you must have said, maybe this isn't for me. Uh, yes, I mean, definitely there was uh, an opportunity that came forward after there was an acquisition. And so I decided, well, I'm really young right now and I need to uh, have exposure to marketing in various industries. B to C, B to B. Uh, so I didn't want to continue in a path and kind of pigeonhole myself into one industry. I really wanted to try uh, the 
uh, really applying the principles of marketing, if you will, to other industries and seeing like could this work. Uh, it's really what interested me about marketing to begin with. The fact that you can kind of take those principles and the foundational aspects of it and apply it to any market, any industry and product or service and, and watch it kind of trickle down and work its magic that way. So yes, uh, you know, an opportunity came um, to, to transition and I took it. No, it's cool. And, I, and it reminds me, you know, I think a lot of kids, I was uh, over the weekend talking to some undergrads uh, from my alma mater who were looking at various aspects of media and arts and entertainment. And one of the things is you think about it, well, I'm really into fashion, so maybe fashion marketing would be, and then you realize, no, oh, marketing is just interesting on its own. And I have to say over my of course of my career, some of what you might think are the least interesting categories prove to be the most interesting in terms of problem solving. Okay, now you've been at SADA for over nine years, which is like triple the average, some say might more. So like you got the eight years at the beginning and nine years now, you're a stayer. <laughs> I'm a stayer, yes. Um, what, what do you attribute your longevity at SADA to? Uh, there's two components. One is... Uh, are you learning constantly, right? And technology and tech services really uh, more specifically cloud technology is just uh, constantly innovating, constantly evolving. So you never feel like you're ahead of it. You're always trying to catch up with, you know, the technology that's developing so fast. And it was such an early stage of cloud technology at the time that I started in 2013 that I was like, oh my God, this is like so stimulating and so interesting. But that feeling has not changed. That feeling of like, there's, there's so much more you can do with cloud solutions. There's always new innovation coming to the market and allowing businesses to grow. But I never feel like I'm done. I never feel like I'm bored, you know. The change is <laughs> happening in the industry while, right around you. Now, have you had the same CEO the whole time? Yes, I See, have. That's, that's the key. I had to make that point because I had Kathy Button Bell on this show and was in the role of CMO um, at Emerson for like 22 years same yeah. CEO. And I think that CEO just stepped down in the last year. And I suspect we'll see, we'll see. I don't, I don't know where, what, uh, what she's up to. Okay. Before we actually get into what you did, um, I always like to ask the question for my 95 year old dad, how would you explain SADA to him? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so I will explain that SADA is a cloud services provider and being able to take organizations who are looking to scale their business and grow it and need to have a secured space for their cloud data to be stored. SADA is a services provider that makes that entire transformation and transition easy on the customer so that they can continue to focus on their innovation we will take on the responsibility of making sure their data is secure and they have the tools they needed to grow. Okay, I think I'll understand that. And otherwise I'm gonna have another 15 minute conversation with him okay. about the cloud and what it does and all that, but we're gonna move on. So- I think there's a movie on that. What is the cloud, right? No, that's exactly, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, it's all good. It's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, when you're buying on Amazon, it's all in the cloud. It's all enabled by the cloud. It's happening. It's all in the cloud. Okay. So let's get into, you and I've talked a little bit about SADA rebranding, but if you, in, in the course of these nine years that you've been there, talk about the moment where you all realized we got it. Cause it was SADA systems. I mean, that was sort of the name, right? And what, when did you sort of decide we got to look at it, this brand pretty, pretty carefully? Well, we actually looked at it a few years earlier um, to, to rebrand. And it was one of the big initiatives that I wanted to do when I first joined the company. Um, but realizing, you know, after some initial research, we just weren't ready to make that transition. And I think part of rebranding is also an internal transformation of the company in its culture. So 
you have to think about it from the inside out first. Is your company internally ready for that kind of a change? We at the time had two separate practices, the Google cloud practice and the Microsoft practice. And initially those teams were completely firewalled from each other for you know, best practices and partner commitments. But what that created was two different cultures within the company. And so even though marketing was kind of like a universal team across both of them, everyone else in the company functioned in different environments. And you very much saw the difference in cultures between the Google <laughs> and the Microsoft teams. So we evaluated and realized we weren't going to be able to develop a brand that would be representative of both of those practices. And we really wanted to wait until the divestiture of the Microsoft practice happened so that we can focus on an one partner. So we went all in on Google cloud and the rebrand at the time, you know, was just ready because of that major transition in divesting that practice, we were all ready now to take on a new culture internally and be able to represent that externally. Okay, I have to stop you for a second. And I wanna sort of, I wanna just really put a giant punctuation point on this conversation thus far. All too often, the decision to change brands is an arbitrary one that's, a, I don't like the color. I don't like the look and feel. It doesn't feel right. What, what you just heard Noreen talk about is it's about an inside out substantial change for the business. We're not talking design. We're not talking logo or color. We're talking about the business, the fundamental business strategy. And so the second part that I want to emphasize in this fundamental business strategy is the courage of saying, you know what? We have two service categories. We have Google and, and Microsoft, and we're going to focus on one. And I know the outcome of this story already. I'm not going to share the outcome of it, but that takes tremendous courage because I'm imagining that could have been 30 or 40 or even 50% of your business at that moment, right? So to say, ah, we're not going to do that. We're going to walk away from that business and focus on that takes tremendous courage. And was there a debate over that? Did like, you know, people go, what are we doing here? It's certainly not a debate, but of course we had deep conversations about it because it's very difficult to divest an entire practice of your team because there's people involved, right? So you want to make sure that your people are taken care of and you're not just kind of selling off and be done with it, right? There was long-term relationships with the people that worked in the Microsoft practice. And so there were several conversations around how to do this the right way, you know, and how to make sure that this isn't going to really backfire on the entire company culture. And how does it then reflect what we do from the business side, right? And how we serve our customers. It was not an easy decision by any means, but I think when we had to look at our company and the growth path we wanted to take and who did we want to align with? Who really represented our own values and innovation that we saw exponential growth happening over time? And that was Google Cloud. Uh, I love this. And had, uh, had we talked about this before I put my book out, um, this would be in there because this is a moment. And so lots and lots of times we're talking to CMOs and they're talking about adding a market and adding a, another practice. And I get it because you, you sometimes it's you have an existing customer and you want to add another service. That's one thing. But when you can redefine your market uh, in a way that you can be the best at, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Best partner for, for Google Cloud versus best partner for Google Cloud and MS, uh, Microsoft, you really are one, you're, you're, it's a bold, bold move. Okay. So having made that business decision, how did you then go about the process of 
strategically looking at 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 SADA, SADA system, and make some some key decisions about what the new brand would stand for? Well, we first started with research. Uh, we brought in an agency that was really aligned with what we were looking to accomplish. And we started with the research of understanding from our customer's perspective and our partner's perspective, as well as our employee's perspective, what does SADA mean to them? What does SADA systems mean to them? When they think of SADA, what is the first thing that comes to mind? You know, uh, it was a cultural decision because we wanted our employees involved in that process. We knew we were going to be recruiting and adding a significant amount of headcount. We knew that culturally this had to stand strong, right? And it really had to resonate and have it be something people believed in. But from our customer's perspective, we also wanted to understand how did they view us when they needed some sort of, you know, technology solution or service, when did they pick up the phone and call us? And same thing with our partners. So first few months was all about the research we did both surveys, and then we also did focus groups. And understanding that, you know, our goal was to go up market from B and corporate uh, up to enterprise level customers. We really wanted to make sure we were positioned properly with our messaging and with our representation to be able to appeal to that customer. We were confident in the services we provided, but now how do we communicate that? to the enterprise customer so that they have the confidence to do business with us. And was there an aha moment during this strategic process where you sort of said, ah, okay, here's, here's this, this insight is really going to help drive our business forward. Well, funny that you mentioned the systems part of it, um, because we realized that having the systems there immediately categorized us into IT services or IT systems. That was obviously a big part of our business previously, but we had grown so much from a consultancy perspective, really getting deep into the business practice of our customers, understanding their workflows, understanding their own business goals, and then being able to evaluate what they really needed to get to the next stage. So we weren't just an IT or security service anymore. You know, we had this entire consultancy team and change management team to help companies really transform from inside out. And so we knew we had to drop that systems immediately. But what we also realized is that SADA brand, the name of the company, because we did think about, do we change the name at this point or do we keep it? But there was a real brand loyalty already with SADA. So uh, that was surprising to hear because we didn't realize it was so deep in some of our customers. We didn't realize it was so deep in, in the ecosystem, you know, but it was. And so we, we knew we had to keep the name, but we really had to refresh it and bring forward kind of the, the key core values that made SADA different than all of the other solutions providers. And so we honed in on those and revamped the entire messaging around the company. And so would you say that SADA is a purpose-driven organization? Absolutely. We have one of our core, valuable, core values is drive purposeful impact. Really making sure that you're driving impact, really understanding you know, what is the purpose of what we're doing here? What does the customer actually want to achieve at the end of the day, you know, and have that be your goal? Got it. Okay. All right. Um, great introduction to the challenge uh, ahead. I want to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get into how you uh, carried this forward. We'll be right back. So I'm going to take a second and plug CMO Huddles. Launched in 2020, CMO Huddles is an invitation-only subscription service that brings together an elite group of CMOs to share, care, and dare each other to greatness. One CMO described Huddles as timely conversations with smart peers in a trusted environment. 
while another called it a cross between an expert workshop and a therapy session. If you're a B2B CMO in need of a force multiplier, visit cmohuddles.com or send me an email or you know, hit me up on LinkedIn to see if you qualify for a guest pass. Okay, we're back. And, and Noreen and I, we were talking, so you have your values. Let's talk about how you started to get from the, the, the research that you did to the execution and what, what was the process uh, that you went through? So we, we talked about the research, but you know, once you got that, the agency comes back with their summary and so forth. But what, what were some of the key parts of the creative process for you? Yeah, so the agency did a great job at kind of taking that information back from all of the research and coming back to us with, you know, three concepts, if you will, of where we can take the brand and what really resonates uh, with us as a team. So the three different concepts that we initially reviewed, uh, you know, I would say they didn't hit the mark 100%. We liked some aspects of one verse and other aspects of the other, but we weren't like a hundred percent sold, you know? So we really had to internally decide what we liked about all three concepts and then see if the agency can then come back to us with, with something that really resonated. And so they went back into their creative mode and came back with the current that we have in messaging. I think it's also in the, in the delivery, right? Of how you <laughs> take that messaging and creative to, and, and combine it together, right? It can't be one or the other because sometimes you like creative that's independent, but then with the messaging, it doesn't jive or vice versa. They work their magic and really brought it together and it just fit where the entire room was like, yes, that's it. That's the one, you know, and, and, and when, what, are they yeah. what are we responding to? Is it a, uh, is it a tagline? Is it a logo? What is it a strategic summary? What, are, what is it that got you to that aha moment where, where everybody goes, that's it. It wasn't one or the other. It was the combination of the entire presentation. So they worked the logo, the messaging, the tagline, uh, and the imagery, the topography, like they presented us with the entire picture. And that's what brought it home to us because it really brought that full circle together what we wanted to stand for. And that's the important thing I think agencies have to understand. You can't just come back with, here's what we think for the logo without all of the other aspects of the brand elements, right? That's the biggest advice I can give, give is look at the entire brand representation together, not individually. Yeah, I know. It's funny. I feel for the agencies a little bit because you're at three concepts and you're trying to get to one. And if you actually end up having to do that three times soup to nuts, it is so much, so much work. But the other point that you make, and I think this is true for just about every company, unless you are doing branding all the time and you and your mind can know how these things are going to play out, most of the time clients, and particularly when you're dealing with folks who may have only do this once every 10 years, right? And not marketers. So you've got CEOs and CFOs and head of sales and so forth. You kind of got to show them the whole darn thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and, it and is a lot of work. <laughs> it's so much work and it's painful if you're on the agency side, but it is, it is the reality because you, you will say, well, imagine how, no, 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 can't simply can't imagine. And I think that's so hard and problematic, but uh, I think agencies definitely need to recognize that if they want to be successful, that's what they're going to have to do is deliver the package because brand isn't a logo and it isn't a tagline and it isn't just a messaging. It's everything. <laughs> and so if you can't show enough so that they can see how all the pieces work together, then they're just pieces, right? Exactly. And so exactly. that's so interesting that it took that. So but the good news is once you saw it all and everybody went, yes, that's it, you can go to execution pretty quickly. 
which is the good news. So give us a sense from the time it took to, we need to make this change. And be, and then you had to find an agency and then you got to this moment before we're actually in market. How long do you think it took you to get from, we need this to uh, everybody agrees, this is it? A year. A year. Okay. And, yeah. and a, lot, a lot of that is, I'm imagining, is the research that needed to be done. Yeah, also and it took time, you know, to do the research and the focus groups. It took a, a few months to plan and execute a lot of that. Uh, and then the creative, obviously, the agency needed time to really put that together. Um, and then we went through, like I said, a couple of rounds of that until we saw that. So it, it took almost a year. Yeah. Um, to do that. We started right before the pandemic. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're like literally that January. <laughs> and we went into pandemic mode and contemplated to be transparent, contemplated, should we do this? Should we not do this? How long is this pandemic going to last? Do we wait? We decided ultimately uh, this wasn't something that was ending in three weeks or a month, right? So <laughs> we needed to move forward and keep yep. the business running and take a risk. And that's what it was. It was kind of a risky move right. to do a rebrand in, in this kind of unknown landscape, if you will. We were confident um, in our business and we were confident that we were going to grow as a company and we needed the brand to make that happen. Yeah. It's so interesting I, as I... As I'm hearing you talk about this, and I know, and I'm cert certain you do know a lot of CMOs who get to a new company, and the first initiative that they start on is a rebrand. And I'm, that drives me nuts. And I mean, I talk to the folks in huddles all the time about this. That is not going to change things for you, <laughs> right? I mean, and wow. it won't, it, it will, it's really important to the company, but if you rush it, there won't be foundational support. You won't have the employee input that you need. And you're going to have this kind of, I'm going to say weak foundation. If you rush this process, you're really going to hurt its opportunity to succeed. Because as you said at the very beginning, this is about employees embracing something. And it's about the whole company coming together to head in one new direction. And so mm -hmm. anyway, just if, if you're a new CMO or you're so fit, you know, think about that. Just put, it may be the really important thing that you need to do. But I got to say, you're going to build credibility by focusing on your demand gen, building your relationship with your CFO, understanding how the business actually makes money. All of these things will build the credibility. So then you know the organization well enough to do the branching. Anyway, pet peeve. Sorry I went off on that. But do you agree with me, Nuri? Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think the other element of that is uh, that CMOs think that they are successful because they rebranded. And then they don't stay long enough to see how that rebrand actually rolled out, like rolled out and was it executed? Was it really successful? So I think that's the other key element is don't rush into it. But if you are going to do it, see it through. Yeah. See it through I, the execution process and really understand was it a success or was it not? And we're going to get to how you look at success, but I, I, I'm just, <laughs> I want to now move a little bit. So we, the agency makes this big presentation. Everybody says, that's it. Talk about now the executional plan and how you rolled this out. And maybe you can start with how much time you spent with employees and rolling it out before you actually launched it. Well, from the moment that we said, this is it, uh, it wasn't final, right? So you, you say this is it to the concept and to the initial design, but then you have to fine tune each part of those elements, right? So that's when you start breaking it down into the pieces of the logo, you know, the messaging, the uh, topography, the photography, the, you know, all of the illustrations. So it took another, you know, I would say, two months, maybe three months to finalize the entire brand guidelines, you know. Uh, and in that time frame, what I started to do was bring in different 
cross-functional teams into the committee, kind of exposing them to early stages of the, the brand elements, getting feedback from them and bringing other team members from the engineering team. You know, how does this resonate with the engineers in the company, not just the salespeople, right? We also tapped into some of our trusted customers who we knew would give us some great feedback, presented it to them early on. We presented to our partners, Google, and their leadership and got initial feedback. So it took uh, some, you know, initial private kind of conversations to get the feedback of we're really loving this, we're really feeling this, what do you all think? And have it be validated by them. And what this did is it kind of set that foundation already and got people excited. It really got the employees excited and you're, you're basically getting buy-in before you're doing any launch, right? Because people feel included in the process. And that's the important thing. You can't do a rebrand in a silo. You have to bring in people. You have to have them be part of it. So they feel like they contributed to it somehow, right? And, you, and you, you want, want them that. to own it. I mean, ultimately, it. employees yeah. are the ones who bring the brand to life, right? They're the ones who deliver on the promise. Right? They're on the front line and they're your advocates. So if they're not bought into it, the outside world isn't going to be bought into it. Uh, and so when we were finally ready, we actually launched internally at a town hall to all of our employees globally uh, and revealed it to them. We made a wonderful reveal video, uh, bringing it all together and had our brand guidelines. And I can't tell you how amazing it was to get the feedback from, from, from our internal employees of like, wow, like, we can't believe this is amazing. This is exactly how I want to, you know, be represented. This is exactly the brand that I want to be associated with. And uh, they were super excited to share it. And I was like, no, 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 wait until the public reveal. Don't share it now. <laughs> yeah, that's a tricky part. I, I remember presenting a, uh, uh, a brand a refresh to uh, uh, internal audience and during the presentation, the head of sales put the new tagline on his LinkedIn profile <laughs> and shared it. I'm like and, something my people would do. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, as much as we were excited that they were embracing it, we had to pull them back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's tricky, right? To plan the yeah. timing of all of that. So we actually had our... Um, internal, you know, town hall on the Friday and released it the following Monday so that it, it you know, had very short time in between. Make sure it doesn't leak out, if you will. Uh, but we had a, a big reveal throughout all of our channels. So the video went out. The social was a big part of it. We launched an entire new website with it, which is quite the undertaking to redo. We sent all of our employees with all new swag, uh, with a new logo and representation with, you know, the, the new design elements, uh, and same with our customers and our partners. So everyone got the news at the same time and it really got everybody excited and customers were emailing us about it. Our partners were emailing, people were sharing on social and it was just, uh, I, I have to say normally, you know, marketing always gets feedback from others and cross-functional teams who think they're marketers. And I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Everybody has an opinion about marketing. I did not have a single employee say anything bad about the brand or, or have an opinion that was not positive. That's not amazing. a single employee, which was uh, an amazing, as a CMO, like that's how you want things to land <laughs> where like everyone across the company just agrees it was a beautifully, you know, uh, rebranded initiative. There are so many things that I that I want to just emphasize in this uh, conversation. One of the things that I see a lot of CMOs do, and, and which is 
not give enough time for the internal aspect of this. But I, I have to say, because you involved employees early with the surveys and the research, mm -hmm. and there were certain teams that got to preview it, uh, you could do a very tight release because it wasn't in many ways, it wasn't just a shocking surprise to yeah. at least senior leaders uh, in the organization. Um, so that's one thing, because generally, and this is, I guess, a, a question, when you do a rebrand, you're essentially saying we're kind of different than you think we are, folks out there in the marketplace. Employees were a little bit different as well. It's the same company that you love to know, but only better. And here's how we're better. And here's how you can deliver on that promise. And so sometimes with a rebrand, you really have to retrain and sometimes mm -hmm. certify. And I'm curious, was there any aspect of the story? Uh, and I, by the way, I meant to punctualize swag, swag, swag for a relaunch. Really important. Just Make sure really this is the one time where everybody wants new logo swag. Everybody who's part of this relaunch wants it. Um, your prospects may not, but employees do, customers do, partners do, all of them are happy to do it. Okay, what was there anything involved in terms of training or things that you had to do differently as an organization to deliver on the promise that the new brand uh, brought? Yes. We actually tapped into our own change management team to roll this out. So uh, they took it on as they would any other customer project. <laughs> and uh, we divided up the teams and made sure that we started with the leadership first and, you know, uh, shared it with them um, the day before, you know, the, the, the announcement at the town hall, uh, actually a couple of days before the town hall, and then, you know, brought the other employees together into training them on like, what does this messaging mean? How do you deliver it? What are the new assets that we want you to share? And really making sure that the employees understood what does this mean for them when they come up in front of the customer? You know, how does it make them feel? And so there was open conversations about that. You know, what does it mean when you say, you know, we're bold, dynamic and nonstop, right? Like, how does that motivate you? How, what do you think that will resonate? How do you drop that? You know, we build strong relationships. What does that mean? And why is it important to the customer? You know, um, so those key points of how we delivered it, I think, you know, made all the difference in the world for employees to feel connected to it. You know, it's like uh, an innate kind of belief of like, yes, yes, that's who we are. And we had all of that. And, you know, this is a, a major undertaking when you have to revamp your entire marketing collateral and website. It is a lot <laughs> of work uh, to do that, but it's so important to have that ready to be rolled out when you make that announcement because yeah. you want them to immediately start using those rather than saying, Hey, this is the rebrand. This is all great, but we don't have that presentation ready yet. So just use what you have and then we'll get back to you. It can't work that way. You have to immediately have them start using the new brand elements. So you have to have it ready to go. So that, that when they're excited, that's what that's when you want to hit home. When they're excited, then you need to get it into their hands and they need to roll that out. Yeah, I remember a client saying, you only get one shot at this to relaunch a brand. <laughs> so you, you better make sure that your pieces are in place. All right, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and wrap up with uh, results and how, how you should measure a program like this. Okay, stay with us. It's Drew, and I want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about doing market research, but didn't have the manpower or expertise on your team to make sure the research was methodologically valid, insight-rich, and newsworthy? Research that can be a tent pole for an entire quarter's worth of marketing and activities. Research that your SDRs can use to help move a lead into a genuine opportunity. It's a lot to ask for from market research, which is why more and more B2B marketers are coming to Renegade to help for this, for help in this area. Renegade will help you craft the questionnaire, field the research, analyze the results, and even write up and design the report if your in-house team is too busy. If you're a B2B CMO even thinking about market research, do yourself a favor and visit renegade.com and set up a time for us to chat. Okay, 
we are back. And we talked, and you mentioned this, that this is a long-term horizon that you got to stick around to see the results. What were the results that you were looking to achieve when you launched? And by the way, when was the uh, when did the brand launch actually happen? October of 2020. Okay, October 2020. Well, we've had a lot of time now <laughs> for you to see the results. Talk about uh, how you measure um, the success of this program. We've measured it on a few uh, elements. Uh, one is the, you know, kind of quantitative aspects of things, uh, being able to measure visits to your website, conversions from your website. How is that new messaging, new elements being utilized, right? So we have, uh, you know, doubled our website year over year in traffic. Conversion rates have gone up over 30%. Um, so that really kind of tells us when they're coming, it's resonating, the messaging is hitting home and they want to consume more. Or we developed an entire insights section on our website that is uh, filled with incredible resources, you know, from blog content, videos, training, uh, on demand twos, if you will. We also have our, our own podcast called Cloud and Clear Podcast uh, that has grown tremendously uh, over the last two years. So we noticed, you know, triple digit growth in our inside section year over year. So again, it's resonating. People are coming to consume uh, all of that. And then we're seeing it obviously in our numbers, right? In our revenues. We have uh, consistently grown the company, but I know it was during pandemic time and, and there's, you know, like a big rush to cloud, right. Uh, during, uh, uh, this remote work environment and being able to have business continuity. And so it was a perfect time that Sada was ready to service those customers. So we doubled our business in that time frame, and, you know, pipeline was like tripled during that time frame, and it still continues. We're not done, if you will, right? We're still introducing new elements of our brand into different channels. Uh, and we started a whole new video series, for example, that is at 27 degrees, it's called, because our, our, our big element is a 27 degree slash. And so we call it our angle on Google Cloud. And it's, it's a weekly series where our technical experts come together. So we're still activating different parts of that brand, even though we're like almost, you know, two years in, <laughs> right? A year and a half into it. Uh, but it doesn't end. So I, don't, I really can't emphasize that enough. It's not, you don't just launch and think like, that's it, right? I've, I've done my work, but that continues in the activation. And that's a critical, critical part of making sure it lands right. And that it has the longevity and the consistency that you want. Well, is there a tagline? Together, we're all in. Together, we're all in. Okay. Okay. And was a lot of the effort that you did to sort of support that and prove that? I mean, because it's a wonderful promise. Um, mm -hmm. And then, but you got to deliver. <laughs> right. And, and <laughs> exactly. so how did marketing deliver on Together We're All In? We really uh, took um, kind of this customers for life notion and being able to communicate to our customers that we're not in this for one time project. This is something we're in together with you for the long to run. And so getting onto the cloud is just the first step that you do. What you do in the cloud thereafter is really what's going to make the difference in your business, in your competitive aspects, in your growth and scale and innovation. And so we wanted to make sure that we're with the customer throughout all of the different stages of it. And then we really put double down on customer storytelling, making the customer the hero of that transformation. We were just on the back end, but like they're the heroes that are willing to take the risk right on this new technology and new innovation. 
uh, and, and bringing that to the forefront, but not stopping there, bringing them onto videos with us, bringing them to the podcast with us to share their stories, providing PR opportunities for them to share their stories. And so it's, it builds a relationship with a customer that says your success is our success. That's it's, how we measure our brand. Amen. On all fronts. Uh, one of the things that I talk a lot about in the book is that when you have a new promise, if you can't bring your customers along, then it's not something's wrong. Um, and, but in this case, it was all about celebrating them and their success. And because the promise was about customers. Uh, together we're all in, which I, I think is, is awesome. All right. Well, we're running out of time here. And I know I could keep going. But let's think about how far this process has gone. What do you know now that you wish you knew two years ago? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think it, it would be, um, I wish that uh, I knew how much it mattered to the customer to uh, have resources available for them at every stage of their growth. This concept of meeting our customers where they're at has become really, really important. And, and we're not making the assumptions for the customer anymore. We're like asking for that concrete feedback and being able then to create resources for them that help them through that particular stage of their growth. And I think earlier on, I was like, oh, this is great. This video is going to be great, right? But it wasn't for all everyone at that different stages of their growth, right? So you really have to segment and your messaging has to be appropriate for each of those segments for it to hit home. Okay. All right. We're going to wrap up and I can't possibly summarize this, but there were so many good insights. But so Noreen, give us two do's and a don't for your fellow CMOs and fellow huddlers. When it's, if it's time to rebrand two do's and one don't. Uh, definitely do your research. Invest the time to do the research with your customers, your partners, and especially your employees. Do bring your employees on that ride with you throughout the rebrand. It is so critical to your success. And a don't would be don't rush. Don't, don't rush. rush through that process. I know. And everybody is in such a hurry to get this done. And it takes a lot of patience and you need a C-suite that will support you. And this is why don't put this on your first item if you're a new CMO, because you're going to need the credibility that you will get by building a demand gen engine or tweaking the engine or building credibility through tests with your CFO so that you can get the time that you need to do this right. So it has meaningful impact. And by meaningful impact, I'm talking about uh, sales double, triple pipeline. That's meaningful impact. If we're looking at doubling your traffic, that's meaningful impact. All right, Noreen, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much, Drew. I really enjoyed this conversation. So for listeners of the show, if you enjoyed this conversation with Noreen Galstium, do us a favor and go to Noreen's LinkedIn profile and just say, hey, I really enjoyed your episode of Renegade Marketers Unite. And if you really feel generous, go to your favorite podcast channel and give us a five-star review. Renegade Marketers Unite is now a production of Share Your Genius. Melissa Caffrey is our content director. The music is by the amazing Burns Twins. And the intro voiceover is Linda Cornelius. To find the transcripts of all episodes, suggest future guests, or learn more about my new book and the savviest B2B marketing boutique in New York City, please visit renegade.com. I'm your host, Drew Neiser. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.